So we'll start the second lecture by Professor Sanat Kumar. No, it's not an old picture. It's a very new picture. That's not the World Trade Center. Where do you see the World Trade Center? No, 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 no. The World Trade Center, oh my God. <laughs> I haven't even started my talk and it's already controversial. The, the World Trade Center should be here. And it's not there. That means it's post-2001. That still is an old sh shot. No, this is 2014. So just give you perspective, this is the island of Manhattan, okay? We are sitting up, Columbia University is right here. This is a shot taken from one of our buildings. So you're looking from north-south. So if you look at the map of Manhattan, it's an island that goes north-south, right? So we are almost in the upper tip of Manhattan. It's 108th Street is where I'm at. This is actually 120th Street, that's Columbia. This is the Columbia campus. It's an urban campus, but you can still see green. Right? This street is probably one of the most famous in the world. It's called Broadway, right? That's the Hudson River. Way down there, which you cannot see. And tomorrow I'll have a day shot. You can see the Statue of Liberty, right? That's all the skyscrapers down in Manhattan. And right there is where our idiot president lives. <laughs> and beyond that, I won't say anything more political. <laughs> It doesn't matter. I'm happy to go on record as calling him an idiot, which he is. <laughs> um, so I've been sort of struggling trying to understand where to pitch this stupid talk, right? So I'm going to keep you guys involved, okay? That's number one. Number two, those three turkeys still will not come down. I don't know why you won't do that. Come on, come on. And you know when a good time is to finish a talk? Anybody know? Say what? Lunchtime, that's very clever, but no. If you're giving a non-lunchtime talk, how do you know you have to stop a talk? With all my training, I call it a half-life test. When half the audience goes to sleep, you're done. So it's completely in your hands. If you guys go to sleep right away, we're done, man. I'm jet-lagged, so that's half of us right there. So Srikant did this to me once, like five years ago. I came into India from the US, non-stop flight, New York, Bombay, 17 hours. Then took a connection from uh, Bombay to Hyderabad, got in there at 8 o'clock in the morning, picked me up, took me down there, fed me lunch, which is a horrible thing to do to somebody who's jet-lagged. And then he made me speak at 5.15 in the afternoon, which was 6 o'clock in the morning for me, and I had not slept the night before. It's the only time in my life I was sleeping as I was speaking. And I don't think anybody could tell the difference. That's the hard part. <laughs> you did do that to me, remember? He laughs. <laughs> Say what? That's right, you took me shopping. We bought some beautiful black pearls. Too. Yeah. I'm also an editor for this journal called Soft Matter. Have you heard of it before? How many of you guys do Soft Matter? Very small numbers. Okay, it's about 30%, right? So this thing, the impact factor is like four-ish. Uh, it's, a, it's a journal where every article is seen by an engineer or a scientist. We decide what gets published. Or 50% is a rejection rate. Please send your stuff in. You'll get a serious review. You'll get three to four reviews. So I'm supposed to talk about self-assembly. And I was invited by my friend Francesco Shortino to come here. And Francesco and I were supposed to talk back to back. But it turns out our travels could never be integrated. So Francesco is going to be here next week. He should have given the first talk, I should have given the second talk. So I'm sort of anticipating what he's going to do. And I first started by saying what self-assembly was. Now, where do you think this definition comes from? Exactly, these people are smart. There's only one source for information, Wikipedia, right? If it doesn't exist in Wikipedia, it's not there. Read this definition. What am I ruling out? by using this definition. Ideas. So it says when you put components together, that's spontaneously organized into larger structures. Okay? What am I ruling out? Question making sense? Is my question making sense? Yes, what am I leaving out? What am I leaving out? You said yes as a way of escaping answering that question. You're still sitting on the wrong side, but yes, you can answer. 
Why do you rule out fluctuations? I mean, most systems are disturbed, right? I mean, you're sitting here and I'm disturbing you. You're perfectly happy. So having fluctuations is not what I'm ruling out. What else am I ruling out? Having fluctuations is normal. An equilibrium system is going to have fluctuations. Excellent. External influence. That means like, yes, you had your hand up, right? What were you going to say? Say something. <laughs> if you put your hand up, if you itch, then you're a target for me. Just remember that. I teach at 8.30 in the morning, okay? And I have a class of 50 students learning thermodynamics. They all want to sleep. So my goal is to keep you awake, right? So you itch a little bit, I'm going to pick on you. So what she said was anything that doesn't have external influence, right? So things that are in a magnetic field, electric field, I'm not going to touch that. What I'm also not going to touch is something that many of you care about. That's an active system. So where you have dissipation is something that I will not touch. So I'm going to look at equilibrium assembly. I'm not going to worry about barriers. I'm going to think about things that will go to their free energy minimum as a starting point. And things like, you know, how do you get over barriers? How do you get to a path? Will be something else that we can discuss later. I'm not sure we'll have time to do that. Okay. And what I'm going to try and convince you of is that all these systems are going to have balances of multiple things, multiple interactions or multiple forces that will sort of drive you to assemble. Okay? So this is what I'm hoping to do. All right? This is what Francesco is going to do. I'm going to start by introducing that topic as a way of setting up what it is I would not do. And then I'm going to put these two guys. Okay? What is this effect? What, what is so special about a surfactant? Why does it do that? Everybody heard what he said? How many of you guys have used soap? <laughs> There's a reluctant answer. Maybe one. <laughs> How many of you don't use soap? Huh? How does soap work, you guys? Anybody thought about this question? I ideally put this picture here. By the way, the, the, the guest house here has this horrible miso sandal with soap, right? Why do I say that? My dad is 92 years old. He comes to visit me six months a year. He'll carry nothing with him, just his clothes, but his stupid Mysore sandalwood soap. Everywhere I go, I'm like, no, my dad's here again. <laughs> How does the soap work? You seem very quiet. I got to bother you. Where are you from? UK. Okay. Tell me how soaps work. Everybody heard what he said? Okay, so what he said is it has two parts, right? One part that loves water, the other part that loves oil, right? So it forms some kind of a structure which exposes the water-soluble side to water, and the inside part is non-water soluble. Most of your dirt is hydrocarbon-based, right? So when you expose it, it can solubilize into the core of the micelle or the core of the assembled structure. That's how surfactants work. The next time you shower, think about that and actually use your soap. Okay, they'll actually do a trick on you. But this paradigm of using a surfactant or a surface active agent is going to be a recurring theme. I'm going to talk about lipids, I'm going to talk about blockopolymers, I'm going to talk about nanoparticles. This thing, lipids, how many of you have heard of this before? This term? One person, two people, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, not that many. Where do you think lipids find the most use? How many of you have done biology? Again, very small numbers of people. The people who know, like the two of you back there, how do lipids work? Where are they useful in the body? Excellent. Any cell wall, any membrane that you have is comprised of lipids. And so again, you have this character of having hydrophilic and hydrophobic. 
You put the hydrophilic on the outside, you have a core that makes up the cell wall that's hydrophobic, and that's how lipids work out. So we will talk a lot about that. And then I'm going to talk about something that is really, really cool right now, which is this is a eukaryotic cell. It's also prokaryotic cells also do that, but this particular one is a schematic of a eukaryotic cell, which has got the cell membrane out here. This is the nucleus. But there are people finding things inside cells called organelles, which are things that do specific functions. But these organelles, some of these new ones, like for example, the stress particle somewhere in here, the stress granule here, these newer organelles people are finding do not have a cover of lipids. So these things are assembling to form structures in a cell without using lipids. So the main construct, the cell wall, the nucleus wall, is all constructed out of lipids, but they're constructs that are forming without the lipid layers as well. So we're starting to do stuff that impacts a whole variety of applications, going from biology to something trivial. I'm going to try and organize those ideas for you in my talk. I have zero clue what you guys know, okay? I'm going to pitch it at whatever level. When you start telling me you're really bored, I'll stop and go faster, okay? Is that a good plan for everybody? So I'm going to give a five-minute introduction to what Francesco is going to do. It's going to take longer than that. So that then I don't, I can sort of tell you what I'm going to do that's different. Srikant, you're doing good? Yeah? You can work on your own stuff. I'm going to bother you periodically, but is that yours or mine? <laughs> that's his. I want to, I'm going to talk about, you know, I told you anytime you have assembly of competing forces, right? So I'm going to start talking about competing forces. And I'm going to take something that many of you know about, okay? I'm going to take water. I'm going to start throwing salt into it. What's going to happen? It's going to dissolve, right? I'm going to throw more salt. What's going to happen? Say what? Leaving the water. Why would they leave the water? So you didn't hear what he said. So the thought experiment, or the experiment we've done before, is you take water, you start adding salt, it will dissolve, or sugar, it will dissolve. Keep adding more and more, eventually it's going to stop. Right? We all know this, we've all done this thing. The question is why? It tells you there are two factors, right? Something is driving the salt to go into the water, but if you put too much of it, it says, ah, 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 no more. Okay, so this competition is what is going to drive everything that we're going to talk about, all right? And that, for example, here is illustrated in this form here. If you take two things and you mix them, this is called the entropy of mixing. S is the so-called translational or the ideal entropy of mixing. N is the number of molecules that you mix. K is Boltzmann's constant. X is the mole fraction of one of the components. So this form here is extremely well known. And x goes between 0 and 1. So if you do the numbers there, that number is always going to be positive. OK? I'm going to ask you several questions. How many of you have seen this form before? How many of you have never seen it before? That's a better question. You've never seen it before. OK. You've never seen it before? No? No? OK. So maybe I should take a moment and derive this for you. Chandan, you didn't do this, right? I missed half your talk. No? OK. So you take two kinds of molecules, A and B, okay? And I want to mix them, all right? So the way people construct that is they do a lattice. And this is my schematic of a big lattice, right? I'm going to throw A particles, and I'm going to throw B particles. And I'm count, going to count up the number of ways by which I can put these molecules on the lattice. I'm going to count up the total number of different ones. That quantity is called omega, and that does this. Anybody having trouble seeing that? I don't mean seeing it visually, but I mean you've seen this before somewhere, right? So this is just counting up the number of different ways if I take Na molecules of type A and B molecules of type B and I mix them on a lattice. That's the combinatorial total number of ways. And then Boltzmann wrote on his tomb this identity. Do you believe me when I tell you that was written on his tomb? Yes or no? I actually went to check. It is actually written on his tomb. 
I mean, what a nerdy way to go, man. Like, I'm going to write some formula that writes E equals MC squared on my tombstone? No, thank you. I'd rather write something much more creative, like this man discovered noise. I know, but he sort of bequeathed as well, right? <laughs> he committed suicide, by the way, which is so not a great story. So you have that formula K. K is the Boltzmann's constant, log omega. You use Stirling's approximation, do a bunch of math, and you get that. All right? And if you want to do that, we can do the tutorial later on. You're going to do this over and over, because that's going to become very important. What is implicitly built in this model? I took A molecules, I took B molecules, I put them on a lattice. Bless you. You're going to sneeze, right? Or you're coughing. What am I assuming about the molecules? Just think physically. I've taken these molecules, put them on a lattice, I calculated the entropy of mixing. Now I want you to think, what have I said about, what are the assumptions I've made in doing this derivation? I have to be able to tell A or B, otherwise there's no... Correct. And that's the denominator. Perfect. Yes, you cannot tell the A molecules apart, you cannot tell the B molecules apart, but you can tell A and B apart, right? What else can you say? <laughs> You're volunteered. What else can you say about What else you say? what? They're distinguishable. Yes, you said that already. I want something new. No? I guess. Total number of particles is conserved. That's an important constraint. We are not going to go relativistic. That's always true. Classical system. Yes. Anything else? Say that again. What do you mean by that? It's very important. Yes. So what does that say about A and B? Say it's simpler. You said they can replace each other, but this is a simpler way of saying what you just said. They are identical, right? I hear whispers from here, and they're whispering on this side because they know I'm not looking. Otherwise, they're going to get... Right? So you assume here that everything can go on that lattice. They're the same size. And you can put things on a lattice, and there's no extra volume. They each carry the same amount of volume. So there's a bunch of restricting assumptions, but under those restrictive assumptions, I get this entropy of mixing. Okay, real molecules, when you mix, don't make that. And so we'll start talking about corrections to that in just one moment. So this guy is always positive. The free energy is U minus TS. S is positive. That means F is negative. Entropy always drives things to mix, or at least the translational part of entropy. Mixing part of entropy drives things to mix. What about this guy here, this W? This is now my contribution from enthalpy. Okay, we don't know what that is. You just sort of stick it in there. So this is the entropic term, which is now negative. F is the free energy per particle. This contribution is negative. This can be compensated by the enthalpy. If the enthalpy is positive, then I have this competition that I set up. You guys have all seen this before, right? And for certain appropriate values of W, I can either call it temperature or I can call it W. W would just go the other way. At small values of W, which I'm up here, I'm always mixed. Entropy causes things to mix. If W gets large or the temperature gets low, which is what Chandan was telling you about earlier, you can get phase demixing. Everybody satisfied? You're unhappy. Okay. So W here is some energy over KT, right? Because I've got a KT down in here, right? So that means if the energy of dislike is small, that means W is small. That could also be large energy of dislike, but high temperature. Okay, I can interchangeably change the energy or KT. So at high temperature or small W, I'm mixed. When I make W large, that means I hate you very much. Then I don't want to be near you. I say so. So entropy causes things to mix. Enthalpy causes things to demix. And so even here, even though I hate you, in this region here of dilution, I can actually get phase mixing. Nobody satisfied. We've all seen this before, I think. All right? So let's now start playing games. And this whole lecture is going to be about playing games. Okay? So I'm going to relax away this assumption. I'm not going to allow them to be of the same size. Okay? And this is a beautiful calculation that Dan, Dan Frankel and his then undergraduate student, Art Louis, did. 
was this kind of a system. He took black, what he called patents, and these diamonds here, and he put them together. Okay, they are not the same size, first thing you can see. This guy is half the size of that guy, it's number one. And the other thing, it doesn't go in the same way, it goes in at 90 degrees. So I'm going to try and mix these black and these diamond-like structures. What do you think is going to happen? These are completely athermal, okay? They're just hard objects. One is black, it's square. The other one's square, it's half in size, but it's turned 90 degrees. You try to put them both in the lattice. What do you think happens? I'm going to limit you at some point with the number of answers you give, but that's okay. Right now you can. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, speak, speak, speak. Why is that? Yep. Everybody understood what she said? So if you have all black, right, it fits perfectly. If I have all of that guy, it fits perfectly. But now look at this case here. I cannot fit a black in here. So I'm wasting that space. So as I start increasing the concentration, initially these guys want to mix, right? Because the entropy of mixing causes these guys to mix, which is the old idea we started with. But eventually, I'm going to have enough mismatch, I'm going to start leaving so many gaps in here, that for high enough packing fraction or high enough filling of the lattice, these kind of spaces are no longer possible. And so in that situation, you can start having demixing happen, where the black guy is packed together and the other guy is packed together. And here is an entropy that does not like mixing. So the entropy of mixing wants things to go, but this packing entropy works against you. Okay, and so here is a non-enthalpic system. I can get balance between two different kinds of entropy, which can also cause demix. Nobody satisfied with it. Yeah? At some point, I'm going to need a blackboard, but we're not going to go there. Good. That brings me to the first focus of what I want to talk about. I'm going to take this molecule. This is a surfactant molecule. I have a polar head group that's presumably water-soluble and I will ask you why in a moment. And I've got a hydrocarbon tail. Everybody know that notation. How many of you are physicists who have never seen chemistry in your life? Some people actually confess <laughs> to that state. <laughs> okay, what does that mean to you? What does that wiggly line mean to you? It's not a wiggly line, it's a straight line, but it's got some angles on it. Any idea why that's there? Carbon bonds, excellent. So tell me more, why is it written like that? See, you're waving at me now. I don't know what you're talking about. Where is the carbon atom? Okay, at the joint. There's a carbon here. Okay. And then why do I have this line at this particular angle? Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So the idea is when you take carbons, right? What's the valency for carbon? Anybody remember? Four. Everybody remembers that, right? Four. So four bonds have to come out of a carbon. So... The idea with carbon is you do that. That angle is known. And so that schematic is supposed to represent that fixed carbon-carbon-carbon bond angle, which is a 109 degree, 54 minutes. And then what you have not done is... That's how you get to valence 4. And here, get that. So that line up there, for you non-knowledgeable physicists, right? and that's almost an oxymoron, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, I have to take my digs here, you know. <laughs> so this is a shorthand representation for CH2 groups strung out together. And this might be a C8 here. It's a very classical effect. Why is this guy water-soluble? Anybody know? I said it's water-soluble. You all said, yeah, 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 that makes good sense, right? Why is it water-soluble? Say that again. Right, there's an H plus here. That's number one, right? Anything else? Is that true? There's an N plus also. So why does that make it water-soluble? Water is a polar solvent. It's got partial charges in the oxygen and hydrogen. When it sees these partial charges or charges floating around here, it loves it. So it's a charge-driven. So that's why this stupid thing is hydrophilic. And that thing is oil-like. Okay? So 
But this is a very classical surfactant. I don't even care what it's called. So. Why don't you look at this guy? Why did I point this one out? It's got two tails, and it's got that group up there with the phosphorus and two oxygens. Why am I pointing that, that particular molecule out? It's important to your life, that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> He's looking at me like, what do you say? She's raising her hand, but she's been told not to talk anymore. So somebody else is going to talk. The second row has been kind of quiet, so let's pick on somebody here. How about you? You don't know about this stuff. He's a physicist. I'm a speaker. What about you? No, 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 no. So we are very creative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shoot, 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 shoot. I'm sorry? I can't hear you. Cell membranes are made of these. Thank you. I'm getting old and deaf and blind and yeah. Cell membranes are made of these. So these are called phospholipids. Phospholipid. Okay? This is a hydrophilic head group, hydrophobic tails. And what do you think this thing, when it's got two tails, is called? It's wonderfully creatively called a Gemini surfactant. Okay? Because Gemini comes in pairs, right? Dark sign, the horoscope sign. So that's why it's called a Gemini surfactant. It's got two tails. Why is that important to have two tails? Don't know. He, he took all this drama to put his hand up and say, I don't know. <laughs> that's what I love about people here, man. I mean, like their hands are like going to Italy, you know. It's, it's, I forget. Indians are so expressive, right? Anybody know why a, a, a Gemini surfactant is important? The Italian guy there is laughing. He knows what I'm talking about, right? If I tell you not to use your hands, you, you're not going to be able to speak, right? <laughs> Anybody know why it matters to have a double tail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why is that important? Good. So the way you think about it is if I take a single tail, if the tail is long and the head is small, that means the head group is tiny, the tail is very big, right? So they don't have the same cross-sectional area. If you put it at a surface, the surface will bend. Okay? By having a double tail surfactant, you're making the molecule more rigid, it will not bend, and that's why you can form membranes which are flat. And that's how you can form vesicles, which is a flat membrane folding back on itself on a very large length scale. So this particular architecture is extremely important when you start forming lipid bilayers. Okay? And so this is what almost all cells are made out of. It's an extraordinarily important construct. We're going to talk about that. So I want you to go back, think about this class of problems, you know, here we had shapes of different kinds being mixed together on a lattice. And I want you to think about this guy that I'm going to argue is going to start forming structures. So the idea is you take this molecule, for example, or that one, dissolve it in water. At low concentration, entropy wins, it mixes. But then you know the hydrophilic groups love water, the hydrophobic groups hate water. You start increasing the surfactant concentration. At some concentration, spontaneous it'll form structures like that or like that, or like that, where the hydrophilic groups come together, exposed to water, the hydrophobic groups hide, and that process is called self-assembly, micellization, whatever. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about today. But to start understanding this phenomenon, I'm going to say many more topics have to be considered relative to mixing of small molecules. And I'm going to ask you to think about what those factors are. So we already talked about translation entropy, we talked about the fact that the hydrophils and the hydrophobes hate each other. Hydrophils loves water. Hydrophobe hates water. What else can you think about that is different from the small molecules? Nobody has an answer? It's all lost. Or is my question obscure? She is like really going, answer, answer. I know you want to answer. No, she doesn't know the answer. What surface energy? Why do you think of that? Yeah, okay, speak. Not very sure. So what, think about this molecule, right? The first thing you'll notice, the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic groups are connected. That means I hate you, but I have to be with you. 
You know what that's called? It's called marriage. <laughs> you think he's joking, it's the truth, right? So you have to account for the fact that these two guys have to be bonded with each other for as long as they choose to. That's a very important thing that differentiates you from sugar and water. Sugar and water, if they don't like each other, they can go away, live in different houses. If you're connected, you have to stay together. So that connectivity is very, very, very important. That's a big difference, right? What else can you think of? You have paraffin wax. Hmm? What's, what's paraffin wax made out of? What's the structure of wax? Nobody knows. Another physicist, he says he doesn't know what... <laughs> Somebody's going to kill me before I leave, I think. <laughs> huh? Long tail hydrocarbons, long hydrocarbons, right? So what does a wax look like at room temperature? What does a candle look like? Is it a solid or a liquid? Solid. Then I light the candle. Then what happens? Near the bati, it starts to melt. Right? Why is it melting? What is happening when a paraffin wax goes from solid to liquid? Nobody understanding my question? I know you light a fire, but what is the physics of what's happening to the stupid paraffin? So a paraffin is a long-chain hydrocarbon. Looks like that guy. So you cut off this group, C16, C18, C20, with the associated hydrogens is what up paraffin wax is. All right? So its melting point, you know, is 30, 40, 50 degrees. You light the candle, as the candle burns, the thing melts. And as it melts, it feeds. Right? What is the process of melting? Why does it melt? No, not a reaction with oxygen. That's called burning. It's separate. So he said a lot of words that he doesn't understand. He said, in the solid, they're all entangled. And then when they melt, they disentangle. Is that true? What is, a, what is the solid form of paraffin? Say what? <laughs> amorphous solid. How many of you think paraffin solid is an amorphous solid? What kind of solid is it? Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> He's not. You never thought about this? Really? Wow. I mean, I'm teaching you guys something. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> You can teach new tricks to old dogs. That's the one lesson. I can say that at my age, nobody's older than I am. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what's the crystal form of paraffin wax look like? Anybody know? Nobody knows. That's what it looks like. The chains become completely rigid. They respect the carbon, carbon, carbon bond angle. But apart from that, the chain is in what is called an all-trans configuration. That means the chains are planar, and they literally look like this. Why is that important? I can bring another chain, put it parallel to it, and it can stack perfectly. And because it's completely ordered, I maximize Van der Waals interactions, and this crystal structure, therefore, is totally, totally ordered. It's a it's an FCC. It turns out either to be an FCC or it can be what's called... What is that structure called? Where you have... It's a unit cell where the outside four chains are going up this way. The inside one is twisted 90 degrees. And I forget what that's called. It's a herringbone-like structure, but it's a perfectly ordered structure. Okay? So in the crystal state, and that's also... How many of you like chocolate? What happens when you take your chocolate and keep it in your hand for half an hour? It melts, right? One time I was taking a flight back, and my daughter and I were flying together, and she went to business class, left me in economy. Then she came and gave me a chocolate, very nicely, right, to make up for the fact that I was in economy. I put it in my pocket and went to sleep. Guess what happened? I woke up with my whole shirt full of chocolate. What happened to the chocolate? It melted. What is the process of melting involved? So in the crystal, I told you the chains are completely planar, they're completely parallel, but then it went from there, about 30 degrees, it melts. What gives? Yes, yes. Don't raise your hand. Just answer. Tell me how it can become disordered. Yes. 
good, and then what happens? He's waving his hands. You're Italian, clearly. <laughs> Just finish, finish, finish. So he said, you go about this temperature, they melt, that means they go further apart, right? We all agree. And then what happens? You already said that, right? You take them apart, the chains come apart. But then remember here, the chains were completely ordered. They're all planar. But you know the carbon, carbon, carbon bond is flexible, right? You can turn. So it'll start turning out of the plane. It'll start forming this horrible structure, which is this horrible, gooey mess. And to make an analogy, it undergoes a transition when pasta gets cooked. It starts out as a rod, and as you cook it, it becomes flexible. That's exactly what happens when you melt paraffin wax. Okay, the chains go from completely all trans to a melted state. Now, why is that important in the context of what we're talking about today? When you're all trans, you have one configuration, the entropy is zero. When you melt, you can take lots of configurations. You can take up lots of different ways. You take a, a piece of spaghetti, and if you throw it up, it falls a different way. Throw it up again, it comes back in a different state. That means it has many different ways it can fall, which means it has a lot of configurational entropy, or conformational entropy. And so for these guys, what distinguishes them from everything else is the fact that you have to connect the two. And two, that the tail has a huge amount of conformational entropy. And these two extra pieces are what makes the fact and self-assembly so very interesting. Have I bored the crap out of you? You guys all getting what I did? Yeah? Okay. At some point, I need to stop doing that. Okay. So how much do people understand about this? Almost nothing. Okay, I'm going to show you a construct, which now I will try to use the blackboard. This is beautiful paper by Israel Ashvili, 1976. He says, imagine a surfactant forms this kind of a structure. The heads are hydrophilic, the tails are hydrophobic. Okay? And he says, if I now draw, call this my hydrocarbon shell, okay? The radius is R. The volume of that shell is four-thirds pi. I divide that by the volume per tail. What does this give me? So R is the only the tails radius. Four-thirds pi R cube is the volume of the tails. V is the volume per tail. What does that ratio give you? This is not rocket science. Okay. Did I lose you? You're following along. You're, you're, you're not okay. Le student. Number of tails. Excellent. But it's also called the aggregation number of the surfactant. All right? I can also say that this. What did I just do there? 4 pi r squared is the area, and divided, therefore, what AH must be what? Areas of the area of the head group, right? So they must both be equal, right? Even I can simplify that. You get this. Very simple, beautiful result, but this is as much as people knew. And then this guy, Jacob Estralish, really did these other calculations. And looking at that, do you know what those other structures stand for? When I get one half and one. What kind of, so for a sphere, I get one third. So these molecules form a sphere. Then that ratio of the volume of the tail, the area of the head group, the size of the micelle, that ratio is one third. If it's one, what kind of structure do you think it forms? People in the back. Have I lost you yet? Did I just jump or no? You're all following, right? What's your name? I didn't catch your name. 
You, you, yeah. Don't look. Yeah. Sorry? Hold on. Okay. What do you think that is? The one. Pick either one. One half, one third. One third is a sphere. Okay? Yeah. He's doing all these symbols with his hands, man. Speak. <laughs> Let me go back. Okay, let's look at these structures, right? This was one third. What do you think this stupid thing is going to give me? How did you guess that? How did you guess that? He's turning Italian on me now. He's like, Ugh. so think about this, right? If it's a planar structure, right? So then I have this. The tails are here. The heads are here, right? Let me pick some random cross section, call it delta. So then the volume occupied will be delta squared times the L of the tail or the R of the tail. This is the volume divided by the volume of the tail, volume per tail. That would be the coordination number. And that should be delta squared over A head. If you simplify that, you will get R tail AH over VT equals 1. So for a planar structure, you get 1. And that means for a cylinder, you should get a half. So this idea of packing parameters is now completely understood. It's totally empirical, but that's how people think about this problem. If you go talk to people, they'll tell you, you know, for packing, you start here, there's some packing parameters that tells you where you go from spheres to cylinders to lamellae, and then as you make the packing parameter larger, everything inverts. People know this empirically, but there is no science in it. Yes? So you're asking an excellent question. So this is an engineering approach, right? You say, what's the molar volume occupied by a tail? So in that condition, therefore, it's a, it's a close pack corresponding to the heart plus the free volume, right? So it's not close packed in the sense you're thinking about spheres. It's the van der Waals radius corresponding to zero pressure. That makes sense? Okay. Nobody following along? So it's totally a random thing. It's totally empirical, but that's the state of knowledge that people have. And so if you go and start thinking about it, there's another class of materials called blockopolymers, which is the same construct, but instead of having a hydrophilic tail and a hydrophobic head, you just take two polymers that hate each other and you connect them. And now, instead of having a short head and a long tail, you can start playing all sorts of length games here. All right? And they behave exactly the same way. You create the same kind of structure, sphere, cylinders, lamellae, and backward, as a function of composition. And it's just this idea of surfactancy playing through. So what I want to focus on for the rest of the 45 minutes I have today is tell you about how people think about surfactancy. And at the end of this lecture, what I'm going to end up telling you is what it doesn't account for all the molecular theories is the conformational entropy of the chains. So tomorrow's lecture then will start focusing on conformational entropy. Nobody understanding the roadmap. So we're going to start, I've given you sort of a macroscopic idea or based on this packing parameter. I'm going to start introducing molecular theories for surfactants. And I'm going to tell you before I start, this theory goes back to 1976. It's very illustrative, but it tells you why you must account for entropy properly. And then tomorrow's lecture will do that entropy calculation. Nobody? Yes. This ratio here empirically is what people find to be the packing parameters that distinguish different structures. So they calculate it to be a third to get spheres, but in fact, experimentally, people find it's 0.13. Okay. Okay. So here is what it would look like. People take a surfactant, okay, throw it in water, and you start to increase the concentration. And here what you're plotting is the concentration as a function of how big the entities are that form. All right? So initially, you start with the surfactant sitting by itself. You throw it in water. And I will argue to you, it goes in by itself. Everybody satisfied? Because entropy is so strong, it wants to move around. 
You get isolated surfactants. It will tolerate the fact that a certain part is hydrophobic. It hates water, but the translation entropy wins, and you see very small clusters. Then I start increasing the concentration. There is something here called the CMC, which is cell mass concentration. Suddenly, now you start to see a picture of a structure here with a well-defined number of molecules, and that's called the micelle structure. That corresponds to this. This is the number of molecules that goes in to create a single micelle. As you increase the concentration further, this concentration grows up, but these small clusters stay constant. And what we want to understand is try and build a theory that will allow you to capture this transition, where at low concentration you have non-aggregated molecules, and at high concentration beyond the CMC, you start getting these aggregates. All right, that's what we're going to do. They all coexist. So you have free short surfactant clusters in equilibrium with that. Yes, you have your hand up, or you're just scratching. You sure? <laughs> Anybody else want to scratch or do any kind of nervous thing? No, everybody happy? Okay. Should I now get rid of this and do the math on the board? So I'm going to do the following. If I say law of mass action. How many of you know what that is? I finally lost the physicist. You have no clue what I'm talking. You teach what? Oh, that's good. Does, he does talk about that? Really? Okay. What am I doing here? Very simple reaction. Two A molecules come together to form A2. Why am I doing that? I'm going to model the surfactant clustering as though it's a chemical reaction. Okay? So I'm just going to consider one simple equilibrium reaction. And I want to know, if this reaction goes to equilibrium, how do I characterize that? Anybody know how a reaction going to equilibrium can be characterized? Say that again. Equilibrium constant. Who's saying that? OK, how did you come up with that? That's what you've been told, right? Right after you heard the Ramayana, they told you equilibrium constant. You heard and said, yep, to both. Chemical kinetic, great. It's all on faith, isn't it? Where did that come from? Anybody know where equilibrium constants come from? I'm going to derive it for you. It's that simple. So here, basically, I'm saying 2A goes to A2. Let me start by saying I start with Na0 molecules and no A2 molecule. That's the system I'm going to start with. A certain number of molecules react to form the dimers, right? And so, if the extent of reaction is x, for every A2 that's created, I have to use two A molecules. So that's how many A molecules I'm left with after I formed that. Pretty satisfied? It's a simple mass balance. Yeah? Still good? OK. So at equilibrium, therefore, system is going to be at constant temperature and pressure. What potential will be at its minimum? Thermodynamic coming back to haunt you. See, I didn't plan to do this, but this is what I like doing. So constant temperature, constant pressure. I put A molecules, they react, they go to equilibrium to form A2. What potential should I be a minimum at? Gibbs, you sure? Say what? He did. He said it. He said it. Yeah. Gibbs energy, right? Everybody remember this? Who doesn't know what the Gibbs energy is? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Everybody knows what the Gibbs energy is, right? Yes? No? Maybe who doesn't know Gibbs energy? Everybody close your eyes. Just the ones who don't know, raise your hands. <laughs> so I'm going to write the form of the Gibbs energy in a differential form. This is at a minimum, right? This is extensive. That's my notation. Great. 
Everybody satisfied with this? Where do I go with this now? So I wrote the form for the Gibbs energy. It's extensive. BGE is entropy, DT, volume, DP, chemical potential of A, DNA, chemical potential of A2, DNA2. All right? It's constant temperature, constant pressure. What does that mean for me? First two terms are zero. So what, what does that mean? Oh, everything is going to shut down. I shut down all the systems. You guys are going to go in the dark. So what's going to happen? I know, but is the lights going to go off? Yes. Okay, lights are going to go off, guys. Perfect. Okay. He's saying you should all leave the room, basically. Yeah? So what's going to happen? Everything will go into dark, and then they'll come back. He can't. He has to wait two minutes to do that. <laughs> it's okay, guys. This is not so exciting. You can see it in the dark. Okay? Hasn't done anything. I haven't made any progress, right? What do I do now? Are DNA and DNA2 connected in any way? Say what? Conservation. So remember here, Na is this guy, right? So DNA will give me this. Yeah? And the other guy will give me this. Which tells me that for any arbitrary dx, this must be true. So this gives me the most important relationship that Lights won't go. So you just scared everybody for no reason. Okay. The lights will. Oh, that was the concern. I see. No, nobody else is complaining that hard. <laughs> everybody see this thing? This is just equilibrium thermodynamics. And all I've done is I've used an equilibrium reaction and mass conservation to derive this. You can do this for multiple reactions, but let's go a step further. I'm going to write it this way. And this you can tell me if you've heard or not. Where did that come from? What's mu A zero? If I set x A to one, that term will be zero. So mu A zero corresponds to a fluid that is pure A. Okay, so I take a fluid of pure A, I mix it with B, that extra translational entropy contribution is what that is, and this is called the standard state chemical potential. Standard state chemical potential, this separates out only the translational contribution to the entropy. Everybody satisfied? So this tells you or I can reorganize that, and I will get this final expression. Yes? And that thing on the right-hand side is called the rate constant. Everybody's satisfied with all this. I just did. 
Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Equilibrium constant. Yes. I didn't want to bring frugacity into it. Everybody satisfied with this so far? So what this tells you is that equilibrium, the chemical potential of A and A2 are the same. Okay? That's the important relation. Once you accept that, from there you get expressions like what you've seen in reaction rate constants and stuff like that. That's an equilibrium constant K. This is the mole fraction of A2 and A at equilibrium. Once you know the rate constant, you can calculate that. If K is very large, that means A2 wins, A is going to go to zero. If K is very small, the reaction goes backward. You know all this stuff. So now let's think about the micelle problem. And what is my Lakshman Rekha here that I shouldn't be crossing? This one? What you said, don't go beyond this, right? So now I want you guys to think about this. I put a surfactant in. It forms little clusters. It forms these big micelles, right? And it forms whatever. It can form basically clusters of infinite cells. What can you say about the chemical potential of all of those different clusters? This color is kind of leaving a big imprint here. But we shall see. Everybody understanding the scope of what I'm trying to do? I have A, A2, A3, A, and this is the size I actually want, A infinity. All these clusters in principle can form. Okay? How do I work out the concentration of each one of those at some point? I, I have a certain surfactant concentration in solution. These different clusters form at equilibrium, and I want to understand the equilibrium concentration, each one of those. What would I do? I've done it for one case, yes, but what would I do for all the cases? Like Chandan did, you would write out n equations, right? But what you can say is this. and so on. Everybody following what I just did? Why did I put those ratios out front? Okay. So I wrote mu A, and then I said it's one-third mu A3, one over N mu A N, so on. So why did I put that one over factor? Say what? It's directly from here, but it also tells you that if I take an n mer, I have to take n of those molecules to form one. So I'm comparing the chemical potential of a single A molecule by itself or as part of an n mer cluster. So if I have an n mer cluster, the chemical potential of that whole entity is mu n, but divided by n, it's effectively the chemical potential per chain in the n mer. So I'm saying the chemical potential of A chains should be the same, whether it's by itself, two mers, three mers, four mers, n mers, so on and so forth. That's the only thing equilibrium thermodynamics gives you. Nobody's satisfied with this. What happened? Why do you look so confounded? Who said anything about No, no, no. This is just saying what... So, to take your analogy perfectly, I take an oxygen atom, I form an oxygen molecule. You don't find oxygen atoms by themselves. You find only oxygen molecules. That means the chemical potential of the oxygen molecule is substantially... The standard state chemical potential, mu n zero, is substantially lower in the oxygen molecule than in the atom. Or if you like, the equilibrium constant is going to be huge and positive. 
So that means that oxygen atoms don't exist by themselves. They exist only as dimers. And all that information about bonding is going in here. All the bonding energy is in there. This is only talking about translation entropy. All the energetics are there. You following? So here, when the micelles come together, molecules come together, they shield the hydrophobic parts. They gain energetics by doing that. And that goes into the standard state chemical potential. Yes? Anybody have, everybody understand his question and my answer. Did you follow his question? But you understood my answer. <laughs> Who, how many of you heard the question? He said, if you take oxygen atoms, right, they don't want to exist by themselves. They form molecules, but they form molecules because the bonding energy is very favorable. Where is all that built in? How is that compared to this situation? And my point was when they bond together, this number is going to be so large that this K is going to become so big that it's going to drive the atoms to form molecules. That tells you all the energetics of binding goes into the definition of that equilibrium constant, or if you like, that standard state chemical potential. And that left-hand side basically tells you how the compositions work out. So if a molecule wants to form a micelle, that equilibrium constant should be big, because that's what's driving things to go. You following along? OK. OK, very, very. Everybody understand what she said? So mu A has got two parts to it. One has got the energetics, which is all in mu A naught. And X is the composition, which is the entropic part. So it tells you, even though I want to very strongly go towards oxygen molecules, because of entropy, I'll have a small number of oxygen atoms floating around. You guys still confused? Did that help, or did I confuse them more? Bull -bull. Huh? Okay, thank you. What would I, yes. Yes, 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 yes. It's the other way around, right? It has to be very much smaller. So if this is very much smaller than that, this quantity is negative. Negative, negative is positive, exponential goes. So how many of you guys understand chemical potential? Nobody understands chemical potential, seriously? Seriously? I'm Okay, so I explained this to my chemical engineering class, and I'll try, and, you know, we're running out of time anyway, but I've got a long ways to go on this. I can keep going. So let's do the following thing. I have two copper bars. One's hot, one's cold. Bring them into contact. What happens? What happens? Thermal equilibrium, right? Heat flows till such a point that temperatures become equal. Yes? What is that? High pressure. Piston between the two. I release the piston. What happens? I have two gases. One is a high pressure, one is a low pressure. Piston in the middle, held in place. Release the piston, lots of noise happens, piston vibrates and stuff. What ends up happening? Pressures become equal, right? And how did that pressure equalization happen? Right, but that's good, but what is the consequence of that? Yeah, correct. But how did that tell you to be the same pressure as I am? See, you're very calm, you're relaxed. I'm high energy, I'm high pressure. I want to bring you to my pressure. What am I going to do? I'm going to go push you, right? I'm doing work on you. So here, by exchanging work, you get the pressures to equalize. Here, by exchanging heat, you get temperatures to equalize, OK? So I have a reservoir here, which has high chemical potential another reservoir here that has low chemical potential. What's going to happen? This you don't understand. But what's going to happen here? Well, something will flow till the chemical potential is equalized. What is flowing? Particles. 
So chemical potential plays exactly the role of pressures for mass flow. So here it's heat flow, here it's workflow. This is the potential for mass flow. It decides where mass is going to flow. You always flow from high chemical potential to low, and when mass stops flowing, it's done. So you take a cell, you increase the pressure, vapor goes to liquid. That means the vapor was at higher chemical potential, mass will flow from vapor to liquid. Till they two have the same chemical potential, mass stops flowing. So this is a mass potential meter. A mass flow meter. Yes. Correct. Excellent. Excellent. Then what happens? At some limit, that's called an ideal solution, right? If you know non-ideality, then chemical potential is exactly equal to concentration, which was that expression I wrote somewhere, right? So I write mu a. Is mu a zero plus R T log x, right? So here, if it's the same solution, I have one high concentration, one low. The standard states are the same. The chemical potential depends only on concentration, and then it will keep flowing till the concentration is equal. As the chemical potential is equal, that's it. Very, very good example. Nobody satisfied. Did that help, or is it the same fog? Okay. Yes. Excellent. Correct. 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 So what gives? What the hell are you talking about? What you say? So everybody heard his question. He says, going from gas to liquid. Gas is high entropy state. Liquid is low entropy state. What the hell is going on? You're full of it, right? Am I accurate? Something along those lines. <laughs> What do you think he's missing, guys? See, he took this conference title too seriously. He thinks only it. He takes things on. Thinks all is entropy. Is that true? No, I did not. I first started out by saying energetics, and then I said entropy matters. <laughs> so what gives, guys? Oh no! Please don't do this. To <laughs> Here, entropy of the universe. I mean, this is like saying everything is always on the head of Rama or something, right? It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, sure. Guys, answer his question. He says gas is high entropy, liquid is low entropy. It's same temperature. Why would you go from gas to liquid? Professors are. No, no, no. Hold on. We'll, we'll get professors. Please don't help them. Let these guys struggle. It's lunch time. They have to stay awake. Yeah. Have to earn their keep. Yes. What balance? So, what is different between the two states? Granted, the gas is at high entropy, liquid is at low entropy. What is low in the liquid? What's more favorable in the liquid? Yes. Somebody say something. This order is the same as entropy, dude. Don't do this to me. <laughs> Energy is low. Who said that? You did. Where is it low? Yes. That's right. So if you listen to Chandan, he told you that in the liquid, they're sitting at the potential energy minimum. Remember, the free energy is U minus T S. U is more favorable in the liquid. S is more favorable in the entropy in the gas state. And so the balance is energy versus entropy, which is what I told you in the beginning. Everything is a matter of balance, right? So when you go from gas to liquid, you're trading entropy for energy. But at the end of the day, the chemical potential, which is U minus T S, has to be the same on both sides. Nobody satisfied. Okay, so let's go back to this wonderful problem. I am not sure how far I'm going to get, but let's do the molecular theory for surfactancy. So I'm just going to take the a mer in equilibrium with the n mer, and n can be any general number that I want. So I write mu a is standard state plus this guy, 
and that's going to be 1 over n. Okay, this is just molecular thermodynamics. I can simplify this, and I will get What are you guys grumbling about? Do I need to do it again? You want my glasses? Everybody seeing what I did here? Anybody have questions with what I did? Okay. Nobody satisfied with this. I think this is correct. This has got to be wrong. Nobody satisfied with this. Now, Xa is the mole fraction of single MERS, and Xn is the mole fraction of N MERS, right? How many molecules are in an N MER? N, right? So, what is the mole fraction of molecules in the N MER? So, this is the, this is the mole fraction of N MERS. What is the mole fraction of molecules that are in the NMR? Everybody understanding my question? No? So imagine I have 0.1 mole fraction or 0.01 mole fraction of 100 MERS. What is the mole fraction of molecules that are in the 100 MERS? I lost you. Question make sense? No. Okay. So what is Xn, you guys? It's the number of NMERS divided by the total number of MERS in the species, right? So total number of one MERS, two MERS, three MERS, four MERS, right? This, each of those MERS, even though they have four chains, for example, per MER, count as only one. And N MER, even though it has N molecules, counts as only one. But if I go back and think about what fraction of the molecules are in N merged, I have to remember each of those has got N. This is what Chandan was doing with his mass balance constraint, right? So if you want to count the number of molecules, that's approximately then N, Xa to the power of N, and this quantity I'll call E to the plus alpha. And to distinguish this, I will call this Wn. So this is the number of MERS, number of surfactant molecules, or the fraction of surfactant molecules that are in N MERS. And this quantity here is the equilibrium constant that I will just call e to, the, e to the alpha. So the general molecular theory, which has done nothing yet, results in the following thing. It tells you that the fraction of surfactant molecules in an N MERS is approximately equals n xa to the power of n e to the minus I'm allowed to do all that, right? Bless you. Anybody confused? So this is the chemical potential per molecule in that entity. That's what you're doing. Yeah? 
Yeah? Sounds like I'm doing mathematical tricks. There's actually a point to this. So let's imagine e to the alpha is huge. That means it really, really strongly wants to form aggregates. Okay? Start out xa really, really tiny. Okay? What is this quant product going to be? Much less than one, right? That means that for any n larger than one, hardly anything is going to exist. I'm going to have basically free chains floating around. You follow me? Okay? I'm going to start increasing concentration. Eventually, if xa becomes larger than e to the minus alpha, what happens? If I start increasing concentration, and let's say I make the concentration larger than that. What happens to that product in the bracket? It's greater than 1. Let's imagine n is 100. What happens to the fraction of molecules that are in the big clusters? It explodes, right? So what does that tell you? It's a catastrophe. It tells you if I increase the concentration, to larger than a certain number, these bigger clusters start to explode. Can I satisfy mass balance by doing that? That's right. So how am I going to do that? So everybody understand what he says? He says, if I start to increase the concentration of pollution, this XA, this is the number of free chains, cannot exceed e to the minus alpha. Because if it exceeds e to the minus alpha, then all the end start to blow up. That cannot happen. So what does that tell you happens? So I start increasing concentration initially, nothing happens, then suddenly I hit a critical concentration, and then what happens? What happens is a monomer concentration at that point? It stays constant. Nobody following? So if you make a plot of free chain concentration, as a function of concentration of surfactant in solution, you're going to see a behavior that looks like that. And this number will be slightly less than e to the minus alpha. But it's going to be constant. And what do you think this point corresponds to? Yes. A lot of whispering. I think people are getting tired. CMC or something like that. Engineers love acronyms, right? Critical micelle concentration. It tells you, you start out with surfactant, they don't want to do anything. You get to a certain critical concentration where the free energy of pairing is so favorable that everything wants to form clusters. And the number of monomers exists, but in a very small amount, the concentration becomes flat. At that point, all the molecules basically are forming clusters. That's the condition in which you want to be taking a shower. Because if you use too little soap, no micelles form, the dirt stays in your body. So next time you take a shower, make sure you lose lots of soap. Yes? Well, I lost most of you. Why are you laughing at me? I'm an engineer, man. wasn't expecting practical. He invites an engineer to come talk and he says he doesn't expect that. So let's, you guys following along? Do I need to do more? Yes. Exactly. And that's all given by this, this, this equation. We haven't said it. See, this, you're asking a very good point. I haven't said anything about what MER is forming, right? That's going to be the next topic we're going to talk about. But here it tells you from the monomer's perspective, there are limits to what I can do. As I start to add more and more monomers, the free monomer concentration wants to increase initially because it doesn't want to form clusters. Above a certain critical concentration, everything wants to form clusters, and then it's over. That's a critical micelle concentration. You're asking me about what happens after that. The way I defined alpha is mu n0 over n minus mu a0. 
So it doesn't matter. It should be independent of n is what you're going to assume. Yeah? Is that the confusion? So he asked an important question. What kind of entities form? I mean, you're saying larger clusters form, but when you looked at those pictures, it was this beautiful spherical thing which seemed like it had a well-defined aggregation number, right? So I want to talk about that aggregation number and what decides what that aggregation number is. And so the perspective Israel Ashwili took was a purely energetic perspective. And I am not going to get done with that today, I don't think, with the time I have. But it's going to tell you, you basically get garbage. All right? So let's think, he took a completely energetic perspective. And he said, let's imagine you form structures like that. Okay, so he's saying, I am imagining a structure that's a linear rod. And we know surfactants form all kinds of structures. They form spheres, they form cylinders, they form lamellae. So I'm going to think about cylinders, that's a one-dimensional rod-like structure. And he said, let me think about this chemical potential as only energetic in its basis. Okay? So if I have n mers that formed an assembly, then the energy gain is going to look like that. That's the energy of an NMR. Alpha is the amount of energy. Let me call it something else. Oh, epsilon's even better. I'm a polymer scientist, so I love chi. So if you gain epsilon kT per bond, this is like forming that oxygen atom. If I have NMRs, the total energy I gain is that. Everybody satisfied? So what Israel Ashwili wrote was this. Everybody satisfied with this? Or if I want to derive that quantity in the brackets per molecule, Yeah. So now if n goes to infinity, okay? So instead of calling this, I'm just going to call this a prime. From now on, I'm going to call this guy mu n0 prime. Just to remind myself I'm doing all that operation, okay? So basically, at the end of the day, what you can show yourself is mu n prime equals mu infinity prime plus this. Everybody satisfied with this, what I just did? This is purely energetic. I'm counting the number of bonds. And this basically, if you think about it, if I have an n mer, the last one alone doesn't form a bond. So this is the contribution from that missing bond. And it goes as 1 over n. When do you want me to end? Yeah. Exactly. That's what I'm going to do in a moment. Everybody satisfied at this point? So exactly like what Bulbul said, I'm going to plug that in here and calculate alpha. I plug this in here. Alpha was defined to be mu n prime minus mu 1 prime. So this will give you n x1 or xa e to the sum number, which is mu infinity, prime minus mu1 prime. So let's do this math over, and then we'll end here. I'll come back and talk about this next time. So alpha is defined that way, which is going to be mu infinity prime plus epsilon kt over n minus mu infinity prime minus epsilon kt, like that. So this will give you epsilon kt 1 minus 1 over n is what's going to go in here.
So you will write Wn is going to be n x1 e to the epsilon kt e to the minus epsilon kt over n all to the power of n. And what we're going to do next time when we come back is use this to calculate what the critical micelle size is going to be. And then we'll go from there. Okay, remember, this is for a special case of rods alone. And we'll calculate the critical concentration of the critical size that it formed, which is the question that was asked. So it tells you you go from a monomer to a well-defined n-mer. You're going to find that well-defined n-mer, and then go from there. Yes. Where? I have a KT problem. Oh, yeah, you know why, right? Because I have KT there, it cancels out. Epsilon is a non-dimensional energy, right? Because I said the energy is epsilon KT, right? So that cancels out with the KT, I'm just left with that. Am I okay? Right. No, no, you're right. I'm making a mistake. I'll come back, clean it up. There should be no KT anywhere because it should be independent of KT. It should be a dimensionless number. So I'll clean it up. I'm, I'm making a mistake here. I'm not seeing it right now. Yeah, but I will clean it up. That's right. I'm making a mistake. I'll fix it. Any other questions? But you guys saw the prescription. I used mass, balance, mass action, derived an equilibrium constant, assumed things were purely energetic, assumed the structure form rods, I'm now trying to figure out the mole fraction of surfactants that are in the different entities. I've derived a general expression. And I come back next time, I'm going to calculate the one quantity which I get the maximum, which will be the aggregate size. And we want to figure out if that aggregate size is well-defined, how big it is. And those are going to be questions we'll do next time. Okay? And then eventually, I'll try and show you why entropy matters. We haven't done that yet. You have a question, guys? Yes. You're still stuck up on the KT thing. I'll clean it up, man. Just leave it alone. I'll... Here, want to chuck? Okay. Say that again, please. Here, yes. Here, yes. So this is for the n mer, right? When n goes to infinity, that term drops out. So I'm left with this guy, right? So this is the infinite mer. Okay. Oh, well, because it's it's going to be scaled by the number of molecules in that entity, right? So to be formally correct, this is the chemical potential per surfactant molecule in that infinite mer. Yeah. So there's an infinite number, but per molecule, that's the chemical potential increment, standard state. Yes. It doesn't have to. I'm saying you have an n mer, right? So the n mer has a chemical potential mu n zero. If I want to assign it per molecule, then it would be mu n zero divided by n. It's an intensive quantity. The monomers, yes, but not in the number of entities. Yes. You guys all good? I've lost about half of you. Let's go to lunch. We'll do it again tomorrow. I have the tutorial. Man, I don't know about you. I'm sweating up a storm. Whew.